Welcome everyone. Um, we are going to set a minute aside for all of our attendees to roll in, um, but please let us know in the chat where you're joining us from um, and just kind of say hello. Welcome everyone. I'm so excited to see people from Northampton, from rolling up Springfield, Holyoke, Fall River, Merrimack, Worcester, welcome. Uh, we're also gonna be live on Facebook. So uh, give us one more minute and we'll get started. So excited. All right, so um, we have hit uh, the 1105 mark. I'm excited to get started today. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Laura Rivera, and I am the Associate Director of Marketing and Communications here at Commonwealth Corporation. I'll be filling in, uh, filling in for uh, Kristen Rain, who is our Outreach Manager, uh, to talk a little bit about the Express Program and today's event. Next slide. So, as I said, I'll be reaching, I'll be speaking for Kristen Rain, our outreach manager, but her contact information will be on the slides as well. Uh, and today we'll be talking about the Express Program. So, um, the Express Program is one of two Workforce Training Fund Program grants available. Uh, it's the Express Program and the General Program. Um, and, but the Express Program has been recently relaunched uh, and has a lot of new great um, information that we have uh, taken from our like small business audience um, and applied. So one of those things is that there are now 100% um, reimbursements for small businesses with 100 or fewer employees, and that is up to 3K per person per, per course, um, as well as up to 30K per company per year. And for any organization with 101 or more employees, we are still reimbursing 50% uh, uh, of your training. This training can be found, um, you can find people in our directory to work with. And if you go to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about the application. So um, the Express program allows you to get funding for training uh, within your organization. The award is actually made within 21 days. Um, so you can apply and hear back really quickly. We have a flexible, dynamic course directory that addresses all of your emerging needs. And within that directory of over 2,000 uh, training providers that are pre-approved, you can select from one of those or have someone join 
that training provider directory as well. Um, and then we'll have a, um, a team dedicated to helping you uh, get through every step of the process. Uh, and you'll be able to get a full reimbursement if you have under 100 employees at your organization. Um, so this is a game changer for us. Uh, and we're excited to talk a little bit about this and um, a little bit more with our panel on integrating immigrants into all levels of the workforce. Uh, some of the in-demand topics that we have seen um, are supervisory skills. So we'll have a lot of like lessons on uh, frontline leaders. We've got professional skills. We have time management trainings, Excel, WordPress, Zoom 101 technical skills such as blueprint reading uh, and CNC machining. And of course, our certifications such as like a SHRM certification or a network administrator certification, all of those can be um, found in our directory. Um, and we can uh, work with you to make sure that your organization has everything that you need in place to be able to upscale and train your employees. Uh, so on the next slide, you'll see Kristen Rain's information. Um, please feel free to reach out to her. She's the outreach manager for the Workforce Training Fund program. Uh, and you can do so at krain at comcore.org, as well as you can reach out to us specifically about the Express program at express at comcore.org. Uh, and with that note, um, I'm very excited to introduce um, or have all of our panelists introduce themselves. So um, today we'll be partnering with um, English for New Bostonians, Conexion, and World Education Services. And I'd like to ask all of our panelists to introduce themselves. Good morning, everybody. My name is Frank Winteralta from English for New Bostonians. I'm the Director of Business and Engagement and Public Policy. And we are very, very happy to have you joining us today. Uh, I'm Phyllis Barajas. I'm the founder and CEO of Conexion. Uh, we've been around for 16 years in the Boston area. And now we uh, have participants from over 20 states in Puerto Rico. Uh, we focus on partnering with our client companies uh, across all sectors uh, to help them fast track their Latino talent. We do that in a new way uh, that's uh, focusing on building their social capital. We match them with executive mentors and entrepreneurs that serve as their mentors for a year long leadership experience. And we focus primarily on Hispanics. And hi everybody, I'm Paul Feldman. I'm with an organization, a social enterprise nonprofit called World Education Services. We operate nationally, but are very active in the state of Massachusetts, I'm happy to say. We work especially with individuals who have international academic credentials, who have training or experience from their home countries and what we do as well as uh, support having them be able to document their educational experience. We also work to try to make sure that people are able to fully utilize their education and training here in the United States. We're really happy to be joining you today. Thank you so much. Um, I'd love to ask you all to elaborate a little bit about your organizations um, and of course your audience, who you're actually like speaking to and what area you're speaking to. Um, so we can kick it off with Franklin. Franklin, you're on. At English or New Bostonians, um, we've been around for 20 years. Uh, our mission is to create opportunities for immigrants to pursue their educational, economic, and civic aspiration. And we do that mainly through uh, making and managing grants to community-based ESOL language programs. But we also provide training and technical assistance to those programs, their teachers and their administrators. And although our name is English for New Bostonians, we operate statewide too, through the English Works campaign, where the goal is to increase business investment in ESOL and positively affect uh, policy advocacy and capacity uh, development. And my job specifically is going around the state, helping companies to set up English classes for their employees. And in Conexion, as I mentioned a moment ago, uh, our model is focused uh, on our, our target audience, our Hispanic Latino professionals. And we decided to focus on that particular demographic 16 years ago because you recognize as Hispanic Latinos are the second largest demographic in the country and continue to trend in that direction. And that the United States is becoming multicultural, um, <clears throat> even though all of that is true. And we're the youngest demographic as well, uh, that we were very, very underrepresented across every single sector 
in terms of leadership from the mid-career up above. And so we decided a group of, I'm a social entrepreneur and a group of other social entrepreneurs decided to do something to really help change that phenomenon because we recognize that as the United States, as the uh, white non-Hispanic population, which overrepresents in executive positions is aging out. Uh, I happen to be in that group, but anyway, uh, <clears throat> as we're aging out, uh, that we really need to look at, I always say Conexion is a succession planning program for the country, that we really help companies, and again, nonprofit, for-profit, <clears throat> academia, government, we really help them look at how do we help fast track your Latino talent. And for a lot of folks, and this isn't just for Latinos, it will be true for any, any group, the more social capital you have, the better you do. In other words, if you're, if you're better connected, if you have a social support system, that on the good days and the bad days, you have someone on whom to rely to help you get through those, those tough times. And we know that people who are really, really successful have social capital. People know them and they know other people. So even when they're not in the room, somebody's saying, have you thought about Phyllis for that? Or have you thought about Laura for that? Somebody else is there advocating, they have strong social capital. So without going into a whole long seminar on social capital, we recognize that our model really does help fast track people. We have one gentleman, I'll tell you a quick story. Um, he is from Latin America, worked for this, one of the big global pharmaceutical companies had been with the company for 18 years. They transferred him and his family up to the up to the US, to the Boston area. And they put him in Conexion the first year. Now remember, he's worked for 18 years for a pharmaceutical company in Latin America, for an American pharmaceutical company. He came here, they put him in Conexion. He's reporting for the first time to a woman and she's Anglo. And he's Latino, raised and born and bred and grew up in Latin America. And they put him in connection. He thought he did something wrong. His mentor is an executive with another pharmaceutical, not a competitor. And his, his mentor is um, an executive. He's from outside the US, lived in Latin America and so on and so forth. And his mentor said to him, trust me, your company does not move you, your family and your four kids up to the Boston area if they think you're a problem employee. And, and they, they came to laugh at his Gus is, oh my God, I, did I do something wrong? Because, you know, Latin, our heritage, we tend to be a little humble sometimes. You know, it must be me, must be my, you know. No, his, his mentor, who's not Latino, but has lived in Latin America, appreciated that, that humilde feature, but helped him adapt. And secondly, and Gus told me this, he said, Phyllis, he was so helpful my first year with my new supervisor, a woman, an Anglo, and, you know, she doesn't speak Spanish or anything, uh, and he speaks perfect English, but uh, really helped him. And I saw him recently over the summer at an event, and he said, I don't know if I would have made it. And his wife said the same thing. She said it made a huge difference. So having that somebody in your corner, somebody's got your back, having that social capital, we find for a lot of folks, immigrant or otherwise, but certainly, certainly for our, our folks coming from outside the U.S. into a very white, dominant leadership culture is, is, a, is a real adjustment. Thank you, Phyllis. Yeah. Paul? Uh, yes, Wes, as I said earlier, we work with uh, primarily with individuals who have that similar kinds of international experience and education. And very often we, um, we do two major things at West. The, the biggest part, and you may have heard of something called credential evaluation, where we, we uh, assess the academic credentials of someone who came, comes from another country who's university you maybe have never heard of, we both authenticate and make sure that, um, you know, we can validate that people have earned the education that they claim. And then we kind of render a report that helps you understand it in US terms. So um, so basically to try to make sure um, that it levels the playing field, that people who have education from outside the US are assessed as best possible on a level playing field. And it's a reliable process and all the universities, um, and licensing boards around the country, you know, rely on a process like this that's carefully research-based to assess candidates for whatever positions. And, I, and I'll say that in the employment sector, it's not as well known. And, and so people are often overlooked. And, and I think all of us here, as we think about the important contributions of immigrants in the workforce, all of us know that there's a huge reservoir of untapped talent. There's a huge reservoir of talent, skills, education, experience that 
um, we need to do a better job as a society, as an economy of, of leveraging. And so, um, you know, this is a little bit niche, it's a little bit complicated, but, but it's an important piece of helping make sure that people can compete on a level playing field. The other part about the work that, that I do um, is that we know that the piece of paper is helpful. You know, being able that, to have an HR uh, manager or a, a, a hiring manager see and be able to validate someone's education is, is of course important, but it's only a piece of the puzzle. Phil this reference, the social capital, yeah. uh, the networking, 80% of jobs or so are not found through the, what used to be called the one ads or through the listings on LinkedIn, but they are, they are found and discovered um, through those social connections. And so we know that there are barriers that individuals face. We started about 10 years ago. Wes has been around almost 50 years doing this kind of work and we serve half a million people a year in the US and Canada in terms of getting their credentials evaluated. But we also know that the other kinds of individual barriers, whether that be the need to upskill in English or, or get a certificate of the kind that was referenced with regard to the training fund, um, but whether that means addressing some of the s systemic barriers, uh, policy barriers, funding, licensing regulations, those are all things that we formed our program that we call our Global Talent Bridge to address. So, um, you know, there's an, a lot of overlap with the, uh, uh, my fellow panelists here. I'll leave it there for now. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, well, now that we know what all of your organizations do, I think I have the, the money question is, uh, what are the barriers and the benefits of integrating immigrants, right? So I'll, I'll give you all a chance to answer that. Um, but we all know that there are definitely barriers already in place. Um, but what are the benefits as well that um, overcome those barriers? Absolutely, and I, and I can uh, start there. So the first thing is, and I'm, I'm gonna make clear, I'm referring to the United States of America. I saw somebody from Canada. So I don't know in Canada, but here in the US, when you come to this country, there is no welcoming protocol. You came out, you came out uh, down the plane and they say, welcome to the United States, you are on your own. So uh, for the kids, they, they, you get to know the culture and uh, at the school, but for the adults, it is really at the workplace where you get to know uh, what is acceptable, what is not acceptable, where you get to see the best and the worst that this society has to offer. We hope more and more the best. <laughs> but so it's not your fault. I'm talking to employers now. It's not, it's not your fault, but it's your job. You, you have to help people to get to know what is possible here. And when, when the language barrier is so so big that they cannot communicate they just can't do their job because they know how to do it remember we we are a, a, a young uh, population but with a lot of work experience paul can talk more about all the uh credentials and formal education that people are bringing but we work with people uh, at english for new bostonians from every walk of, uh, walk of life, people with a very little formal education, people with higher education, but they all are here because they want to work, they want to do the best. And when, when we know that English classes are so important is because there's a huge uh, gap for, for English services. From We know from census data that we have almost 600,000 workers in Massachusetts that are not fluent in English. That's, that's one of in every 10 workers in Massachusetts. And I do this work with companies, right? But we do know that we have like 20,000 people on waiting list. And when the companies are able to bring the English classes to their workers, it's huge. And we see that, we, we see people flourishing, we see showing to their employers what they are capable of, when they have this opportunity to finally express and express themselves and say, this is, this is what I think is how it should be done. So all this is possible when, when employers invest in the English language skills of their employees. And I, I would agree with everything you said, Franklin. Um, the, the command of, of the language is really critical, especially if you're talking about a particular industries. So obviously in healthcare, and technology, I mean, pick an industry where there's going to be 
there's social English that you use, you know, at a dinner party or something or out with friends. And then there's the English you need for the job. So I think that I think it's really important. I, I love what you and Paul talked about already, you know, be helping companies really identify, you know, the, the credentials that people have so that we, we have, it changes our expectations. Just because you don't know where that university is in, in, in Mexico or Colombia doesn't mean that it isn't a good school or they're not well prepared. It means that you need to do a little bit of homework. So Paul, I, I'm going to follow up with you myself for our clients. Um, and Franklin, I would agree with you as well, even workplace Spanish across any industry and also bringing that that those programs on site on campus in some industries years ago when I worked for um, a, a publishing company years ago we were all over the United States but we did that in the warehouse that we had in in the Chicago area we brought the, the English classes onto the campus of the warehouse and we provided Spanish classes for the first line supervisors uh, so that they had a little bit more command of the of the language as well and we also thought it would give them a little bit of sensitivity to being good at what you do and the challenge of learning a second language to do your job. And it's like, oh my gosh, it opened up their eyes. So two ways, so think about it in your particular industry, is there an opportunity for two way language acquisition and, and growth? Uh, the other thing too, is that I think is important is that as, as we look at having a, a diverse talent pool, uh, we keep forgetting that, that the population is shrinking. OK, that we're losing population in the United States and in every developed country. All right. In the United States, we would have lost population, not just in Massachusetts, but in the United States, had it not been in our case of, of the for the Hispanic population. There are other immigrant groups. Uh, however, the, the largest group uh, right now happens to be Hispanic. So it's something to think about when you think about immigrants that you really need to understand both gentlemen have alluded to one in 10 or whatever the population number may be for a certain category. The point is that as the youngest and the, the second largest, this is what you have to work with. So how are you going to develop a new approach? And I wrote down a new approach, question the status quo. And people have said this to me, I don't, I don't know, a bazillion times. Well, Phyllis, uh, we couldn't find any. Uh, you know, so they're looking for an ex a, a director of finance or a director of something, and they can't find any, okay? Uh, well, uh, you can't find any maybe because you haven't looked in, uh, in, in a new place. So I always say, if you fish in the same pond, you're going to catch the same fish. So maybe reassess what you do, what's your approach, look past the status quo. What a thought. Uh, so I, you have to be intentional. You have to say to yourself, and I used to say this when I was an inside HR person, I'd say to my team, and what have you done this month? Uh, what's your point of contact this month? And I would say to them, you have to pick one new group per month. Just let's start there. One new group in which to, to insert yourself. So I think just little things like that start to open up our networks, um, as, as Paul mentioned earlier, because that networking goes both ways. So where are you looking? Where are you trying to connect to really develop the pipeline of talent that you need at every level of your organization? Uh, so I think that's something to think about is uh, move beyond the status quo. Um, and then I'll put in a shameless plug for Conexion. The other thing that we find is we had a gentleman, a managing partner uh, of one of the large accounting firms, of course there's only four left, but anyway, uh, and uh, they had no Latino partners uh, in the Boston office. And uh, he enrolled the one gentleman that he had that he he really had invested a great deal in inside uh, to this individual. And he said, I wanna put him in your program. And this is from a gentleman who is your stereotype. I love this man to death, but stereotype the white executive, really great guy, we're on a board together and all this good stuff. And he said, I wanna put him in your program. He said, he's a great internal citizen. He said, he's been mentored by folks inside, but he's gotta build a book of business. And he said, he didn't grow up here. He didn't go to college here. He is absolutely stellar. I think he would make you know, a great you know, partner, what have you. And he said, I wanna put him in your program and I want you to find him a mentor that will help him learn how to build a book of business. And so we did that. And guess what? He's, he is now a partner in this, firm and I'm very proud of that. But that was just an example. Had his had had the managing partner 
not been willing to invest in moving beyond the status quo. He didn't do what they've always done. He said, what do I need to do to answer that question? How do we help immigrants who may be absolutely stellar and they're missing something, but it's not for lack of ambition, smarts or anything else. It is simply lack of access. And he was able to see beyond that and then decide, well, what if we got him a mentor? Uh, we've had that happen uh, in, in other situations. That's just one example. But again, what do you do? How do you recruit and retain? And once you have folks in, how do you onboard them? How do you develop them over time? So if you're doing the same thing that you've done before, I would submit that you need to step back, talk to people like are on this panel and some that are here in this meeting, and uh, you know we can give you some more suggestions, but I'll stop there for now. Pick it up, I couldn't agree more. It's, it's such, uh, it's um, all the things that are being talked about by Franklin and Felicia, so being so true with the experience that we have as well. Um, so we're getting back to questions about the barriers. One of the one of the advantages of the people, for the people on this call and for the people in, quite honestly, in Boston and Massachusetts, is that employers in particular do have access to to the kinds of resources that, in many cases, I have not seen in other parts of the country. So you think about the barrier of English language proficiency. Um, you've got this amazing set of programs. You've got English Works and English for New Bostonians, and you've got programs even within the Workforce Training Fund that touch on um, English language as well. You've got groups like Connexion that can address some of the social capital issues and network building issues that are really important for people who come from another culture and need a little bit of support in that area. Um, you know, one of the things when I think about the individual barriers, um, I mentioned the credential recognition, getting someone's degrees recognized. There, there is a process for that. It's pretty straightforward, if not well understood. Um, but then you also have, you know, on an individual level, navigating the system, um, finding access to training programs. So I think it does fall on uh, employers and CBOs and organizations that are supporting individuals um, to think systemically. Uh, again, you have this, you, you have resources in, in Massachusetts that are unusual and that are unique and that um, you all should take advantage of quite honestly. Um, and then there are, um, you know, the issues of the payoff. Um, it's just so clear. Uh, it's so clear that, uh, that immigrants, um, if, you, if your organization can tap into immigrant talent from within your organization, so your incumbent workers, I guarantee, I don't guarantee you may be small organizations, you may know all your employees well, um, but it's not at all surprising when we see individuals who are engineers, who are, who are doctors, who are accountants, who are working in entry-level jobs in companies who didn't, haven't really done the kind of assessment that could have been done on the front end and could have allowed them to look for uh, pathways to more suitable employment for people who bring experience and talent. Um, but if you leverage immigrant talent in the workforce, you will have a competitive advantage. Um, these individuals are multicultural, multilingual. They can tap into new markets. They can bring new perspectives. They can bring experience from their home countries that, um, that you may not have access to through native born employees. And multicultural organizations are successful and diverse organizations are successful. And I think that's uh, the opportunity is, is uh, it's actually, it's low hanging fruit. You've just got to, you, you've got to take some efforts and think about it proactively and, and you can be very successful. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit about your specific organizational approach um, and maybe some recommendations on how listeners can implement that. I'll go uh, first. Yeah, I'll go first. Go ahead, go ahead, Philip. I have all these notes. I've got to <laughs> use them. <laughs> so what? So so say the question again one more time, please. What's your question again one more time? Happily. Um, what is your organization's approach, and how can listeners uh, that are with us today implement that at their organizations? Okay. So a couple of things, uh, and these are things with which I have firsthand, uh, you know, involvement. 
Uh, one is looking at, at job redesign. You have control over that. We, you know, we write job descriptions and all that. I'm actually going to be looking for a position and for somebody on my team. And, and it's like I said to her, I said, you got to write the job description. It's like, oh, I hate doing that, but we have to, okay? And one of the things that came up, uh, we did a, an event, uh, Conexion did an event with uh, Secretary Acosta's uh, office and the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston and the Latino Equity Fund on a similar topic to this. But one of the things is that there's a growing innovation in job redesign. And this is, I'll have to find the citation, okay? But, um, but what they found is looking at this, the idea that you have a lot of jobs will say you need a bachelor's degree or it's required, okay, for the job. And what we're finding uh, is that you have to stop and say, well, why does this person need a bachelor's degree, especially if it's in political science? You know, I mean, with all due respect to my daughter has a degree in political science. She's not doing anything related to political science. Um, so what are the, so really looking at what are the emerging industries and what skills and qualifications might they need? And, um, and, and the, the research that they cited for taking a hard look at job redesign and what you really need to do the job is if you arbitrar arbitrarily say that a job needs to have a bachelor's degree you are screening out over 70% of African-Americans, you're screening out about 80% of Latino, Latina workers, and you're screening out over 80% of rural Americans of all races. I'm from Omaha, Nebraska. And he explained, and you're doing that before any skills are assessed. So I just put that out there. I will find, Laura, the citation. But you, if I were you listening, I would say, oh my gosh, Good point. And I've seen this when I was inside as the director of HR in a number of organizations. I would say to the hiring manager, do you really need a bachelor's degree for that job? Really? We do? You know, I would make the case that we're going to screen people out by doing that. So I think that's something that we do so much. We write job descriptions. Does anybody stop and question that? Because again, this is what it's telling us. And what does the job really require? Uh, so I just wanted to put that out there. Um, and, and the second thing is, is looking, at, um, looking at your existing workforce and removing any barriers there. I always mention Beth Israel and Joanne Polkowski, who I know many of you know, and Joanne has done a really great job of looking at how to identify what are the needs, who's, who's underemployed in her organization, uh, Beth Israel, uh, finding ways to uh, have command of English, uh, put them through a, a school, and then they do their internship. She has one gentleman, she said, went from being a pharmacy tech to now he's director of the pharmacy. So again, you might have talent right, 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 sitting right next to you somewhere in your organization. So actually doing an assessment. This isn't yeah. rocket science, just I, that. I was gonna say that. I, that's, uh, we at English for New Bostonians and every, every other workplace ESL provider in Massachusetts does, if he's doing their job well, We'll do a, what we call a workplace needs assessment, yeah. which it sounds fancy, but it's basically listening to people. Listen to the people that you are that is your workforce right now, or that you are as, as screening in, and you discover a bunch of things. Like we go there, I you know I was doing a, a workplace needs assessment at a restaurant the other day, and I was like, so um, what is your job here? I work at the salad uh, station. Okay, and. Uh, what is the highest level of education you, you reach back in your country? Oh, I, I finished uh, uh, my college uh, um, degree. And what is it? It's business administration, and she, right? This restaurant could be taking advantage of that. And it, it goes a, a, again and again. And it's just like, listen to who you have working for you because they have untapped, untapped talent that you could be. The problem is that that information was shared with somebody at the company, but it never made it to the, to the strategic decision makers of the company. And that's something that we all need to work together because, you know, like we are doing two other workplace needs assessment, a manufacturing company. We, from people that want to take the English training, 35% of them has college education. Another 40% have uh, high school diplomas. And like, some of these people could be fast tracked for, for leadership positions in this company if the people making decisions know about that. And by offering the English classes, that's where all these things come out. They're, they're 
eagerness to learn the language and to prove themselves what all, all the skills that they are bringing. And that is a, is a, a huge opportunity that companies have here in the US. About, about our approach and I'm thinking about the work we do and, and we, we are not a direct, other than the credential evaluation, we're not a direct service provider. We don't, at West, we're not involved in teaching English or, or upskilling or training. Um, and, and, but we're very much about um, elevating talent, right? Recognizing and elevating talent. And I think one of the, the, the two things that I think we do as a, a different sort of organization, as, as, as someone who operates nationally, is partnership is essential to our work. And I, I think that, um, I think about, we, we actually involved the city of Boston uh, two or three years ago in a program that we call our skilled immigrant integration program. We work with eight communities each year from around the country, from uh, Lincoln, Nebraska to Anchorage, uh, sorry, uh, to Anchorage, Alaska, uh, to Boston, to, uh, to Northwestern Arkansas, to uh, the state of Michigan, the state of New Jersey, many, many others. Um, and within that program, what we have learned is the importance of bringing together workforce providers and adult educators and chambers of commerce and employer groups um, and community colleges who, who to sort of, and we, we have them focus on this issue of, of skilled immigrant talent and what can be done. And, and through those partnerships, I can tell you in the city of Boston, um, we work with the Office of Workforce Development um, they were sort of the lead, but so many organizations were involved with that work, including, a, uh, I'm thinking of an organization that is just so impressive. It's called the African Bridge Network um, that has forged its own partnerships, right, with the city of Boston and has fellowship programs and does mentoring to, to, to uh, echo what Phyllis is talking about. They do mentoring, they do career preparation, um, but they do that with, and they work with that Boston Healthcare uh, workforce organization uh, that was referenced as well. Um, there were organizations in your communities that um, do a piece of this work and maybe even do a large piece of this work, but very often can't really complete the picture without working through partners. So I think about the Welcome Back Center at Bunker Hill Community College that uh, helps to prepare nurses, both their English and their, and as well as their licensing preparation. I think about JBS Boston, which is one of the nation's leading workforce organizations focused very heavily on the immigrant and refugee populations here in Boston. So you have a great infrastructure in Massachusetts more broadly, you have the Workforce Training Fund. Um, so partnerships are really essential. The other thing I have to say is that we are in the fortunate position because we see what's happening around the country to try to elevate that. We do a lot of policy work. We do look at um, structural barriers as well as you know, how, can we, how can we support individuals through, through services um, what about those licensing rules that make it especially hard for an internationally trained nurse to get back into his or her field? Um, what are some of the biases that are unintentional but very real that keep people from being able to access their profession? So we work a lot at the policy level. Um, we have been, we just launched in fact, a, a, a social media campaign called uh, hashtag untapped talent. In fact, we've used the term a couple of times. Um, and we have national partners from, uh, from an immigration, sort of immigrant and immigrant serving organizations, as well as many other local community based and, and even governmental organizations that have been involved in this. So for our approach, we really try to raise awareness and bring people together around an issue and try to, try to ensure that there are complementary and collaborative partnerships that are going on because any one organization probably can't take care of all of these things, right? But working together can very often make great progress. We saw great progress in, in Boston and we've seen it in many of the communities. We're now working all together, more than 32 communities and they are, I think it's an important point. These are happening, the work we do and the work we see is not happening in the so-called blue states. Um, one of our su most successful programs is working with the Adult Education Office of the Texas Workforce Commission. We're not typically known as um, certainly not a blue state. Um, the economic imperative, the economic cost of having an engineer not being able to work in his field while you have shortages in tech companies, while you have skill shortages, that costs all of us money. That costs society money. Um, 
the Migration Policy Institute. There are 2 million underemployed college educated immigrants in this country. The Migration Policy Institute did an economic analysis, $39 billion a year um, left on the table, wages that those people really should be earning if they were working at, their, at the level at which they were trained and have experience. Um, that's all being left behind. And, and when people earn an extra $39 billion, that's $10 billion in tax revenue that goes to the, to the feds, to the states, and to the locality. So there's an economic interest here. There's a human interest. There's, a, there's an effort that we all make to try to make sure individuals succeed and can contribute. Um, but let's, uh, let's also recognize that we can be, as a society, um, there's, there's a great deal of value that we're leaving on the table. Right, and so everybody wins if we think about this challenge in that way. Thank you so much, everyone. I think a lot of what we've heard over and over again is about you know not leaving talent on the table, um, our needs right now as a society, and also building these relationships and these partnerships, which is what this entire series is about. Um, this is the reconvene series, and um, we're talking about bringing organizations together, bringing employers um, together with our community-based organizations, because at the end of the day, um, we're looking at some larger problems that none of us can solve on our own. Uh, and so really what we have to do is work together and then build these relationships um, and all of these resources here are going to be there to support in doing that. Um, and I do want to ask one last question before we go to the audience. Um, feel free, attendees, if you would like to ask any questions to put them in the chat. Um, we're going to have Claudia joining us in a little bit um, to help ask some of those questions. But uh, from our end, um, how do you ensure that you are not missing opportunities? <laughs> Wow. <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, I, I, I sleep less. So, you know, I have more time to focus on opportunities. Uh, and uh, I think uh, I, I think with opportunities, you have to be willing to uh, step outside your comfort zone. You have to be willing to take risks because uh, there's a quote that I found that says, you know, out of, you know, the COVID and the pandemic, uh, you know, out of out of these tragedies can come some some opportunities, uh, but they're fraught with a lot of, uh, you're gonna go down some roads that aren't the right ones and so on and so forth. So I think it's a willingness to get outside your comfort zone, take some risks and engage allies, engage allies and give yourself time. Uh, change takes time and significant change, which this is, takes significant amount of time. Yeah, I would, I would say, to, again, to employers, um, it is a matter of taking a step back and trying to get out of the, you know, the day-to-day -day operations and really thinking about who, who's working for me and how can, by, by helping them to grow, that will translate into growth to my, to, uh, uh, to my enterprise too. And we'll see it all the time. I, I talking to uh, business owners and general managers that they see it very clearly that, uh, you know, the, the old joke of, oh, but what if we train them and they leave? Well, what if we don't train them and they stay, right? So <laughs> we need, the opportunities are there. And yes, there are risks, but you have to take them. Yeah, yeah. no, I think, I, and um, I think, the other piece of this that's very important, uh, aside from what, what Phyllis and, and Franklin both said, is um, you have to you have to be able you have to be able to step back, but you have to be able to think in terms of um, investment rather than just purely cost. Right? Yes, if you step back, if you take a risk, if you decide to um, uh, move in a new direction or to do some new things. Um, that is an investment that that can and will pay off. Um, and I think that, um, you know, this economy is moving too fast. I mean, labor market right now is, is brutal. Um, you want to be out there showing that you are a welcoming employer, that you are an organization that is, um, that wants to make the most and give people the most opportunities. Um, and that may be a little bit different than the economy was, you know, some years ago. And that, um, you know, workers are a little bit more in the driver's seat. You need to be thinking very proactively about how to 
not only retain, but have give people opportunities to advance because if, if you don't, they'll find that opportunity elsewhere. Absolutely, absolutely. It has a lot to do with um, employee engagement and making sure that you're taking care of, of your employees because right now with the great resignation, with everything that's been happening, um, it's, it's a really good time to start looking at those practices with your organization um, and re restructuring your practices. Um, I am inviting Claudia to join us um, to see if there are any questions um, from the audience or any questions that she may have that she wants to share, but um, I can also throw a few out there. So let me know. Okay, thank you so much. This was a great session. My name is Claudia Green. I'm the executive director of English for New Bostonians and so happy to be here with this great panel and I'm grateful to, to Commonwealth Corporation for hosting this. Um, so, and, and, you know, I, I've been taking a few notes thing is great to hear some of the things that remain with me from, from uh, the panelists comments, you know, from, from Phyllis, if you keep fishing in the same pond, you're going to catch the same fish <laughs> and Paul, um, your hash, I love that you're using the hashtag untapped talent. I think that really makes people think, um, and, and, you know, and, and Franklin, you know, what if you don't train people and they stay, right? I mean, those should be things that just sort of stick with us um, through the rest of the day. Um, so I do want to open it up to questions. Of course, I do have some, some stored up. I know we had, there was a question early on um, about uh, just, so I'm going to be watching the chat, but there was a question early on from someone who uh, owns, has a woman owned uh, cargo and shipping company and was looking for how do I connect with people who have that talent? How do we, they're looking to hire. So, um, and then, you know, we do have a few more qu questions coming in. Is, can someone take that, perhaps someone from Comcore or Franklin maybe? Do you wanna? Sure. Um, as I was saying that the workplace is the, the integration for, for new immigrants but also the, what we do, right? The community workplace, um, the, the community as well programs where people come to learn English if they are lucky enough and if, if they wait for a year or two to get into that class. Those, uh, we have programs like this all over the state. And I encourage employers to work with them because many, many of the immigrants that are trying to improve their English language skills are also looking for better uh, employment opportunities. And I'm, I can tell you that the, the directors of those programs will welcome you open arms because part of their mission obviously is also place these people in good jobs. So I will definitely start there uh, working with those programs. Thank you. And maybe we can, um, whomever asked that question, maybe someone from Comcore can actually follow up on connecting with career centers, et cetera. Um, I'm going to jump, I'm going to throw in a question that I had, which I wanted uh, to see what your answers were. So what is, um, you know, for any, for employers and even for um, other, you know, nonprofit and governmental organizations that might be here, what is one thing that you would suggest that they do, that, that every employer do um, you know, soon in the next month or so, and who should be involved? Like who, who should be involved in that conversation within their workplace and, and bringing in partners? Um, Paul, you want to take a crack at that? Um, yeah, you can't start too soon. So within the next month, um, I would, I would, I would say that it's worth. I mean, from my again, from my perspective, I'm I'm not in the local area, um, but I know that. Um, Boston has some tremendous organizations that support immigrants in a variety of ways. And I think um, the extent to which, as Franklin just said, you know, if you reach out to a JBS Boston, to one of their, you know, to their career counselors or to their uh, uh, placement office, or you reach out to um, AACA in Boston or to African Bridge Network, um, if you uh, reach out to some of the ESL programs, I think you will find receptivity. Um, are you going to be able to fill that exact position? You know, maybe not. And I think, you know, depending on if you're a, a smaller employee or a larger one, I think the, the idea is to begin to try to establish those relationships. Now, there are, um, of course, as, as you mentioned, Claudia, there are the, the workforce centers that serve a broad uh, range of sectors and as well as a broad range of jobs. And I, and I, I, 
I don't know all the particulars of those centers, but I think that's another place to start very uh, specifically. The other thing I would just say is that, mm -hmm. um, you know, when you talk about a, a job in career, uh, sorry, in cargo logistics or supply chain, um, what transferable skills are you going to be looking for? Does that person have to have six years of experience in that already? Well, that's going to narrow your pool. Is that someone who can mm -hmm. join a team, build on similar skills that they may have had in a different industry or in a different sector um, and grow into that position? I think it's really important to think about, uh, particularly, I mean, it's a win-win it's a on both ends. There are immigrant engineers who are maybe driving for Uber or working as cashiers, where they're not using any of their skills, they'd be happy to get a job that gets them halfway to the career that they used to have, right? And for you, can you imagine, uh, Phyllis talked about thinking about the job specs, can you imagine configuring your team a little bit differently so that the person doesn't have to come in knowing everything, right? It, can they come in with transferable skills um, and, and think in those, um, in those ways, I think you approach um, organizations that are working in the community, um, you, you, can, you will find people who are sort of ready to move up and ready to take that sort of inter, intermediate position um, and that over time will grow and will be a benefit both to your organization and to that individual as they grow in that job. I just mm -hmm. wanna piggyback on, on what Paul said. Uh, I, I am such a big believer. I love it. Transferable skills. And I think that that is something that is so overlooked so often. And I break it into two different buckets. One bucket around uh, transferable skills is uh, in terms of uh, what we now call essential skills, the people skills. How do they, how do they build collaborative teams? Uh, how do they give direction? How do they problem solve? Regardless of what it is whether it's you know, working in the for-profit or nonprofit sector, government, whatever, but those are essential skills. Have they demonstrated that? Do they have good attendance? You know, th basic stuff, you know, um, you know, what's their track record around you know, you know, being punctual and all that good stuff. So, but the essential skills mm -hmm. to me are so, so important. And then on the, on, the, uh, on the technical side, I don't necessarily mean technology per se, but are there certain things, like I was just talking to somebody this morning and a candidate that I had nominated, uh, she was a finalist, didn't get the job because she was less familiar. With, it included some reporting to the state and federal government. Okay, and her experience was more uh, doing some type of reporting, but more industry specific, not government so much. And I said, there's a missed opportunity. And this is at a bit more senior level, white collar job. That said, what she did bring, I said she could have learned how to interact with the city and the state on these reporting, uh, you know, uh, uh, things that they have to do. What she brought that was over and above the frosting on the cake is she has a very, very well developed, diverse network, primarily Latino but not exclusively, around the region, the catchment area for the organization. And I said somebody wasn't thinking longer term. They were thinking immediately. Oh, we have these reports that we have to do. I'll have to train her on the re on the on the on the reporting process. This is not rocket science, people. You know, and she's a bright woman with 20 years experience. So sometimes I think looking at what are the transferable skills that matter, what do you need now and in the future, and then what are the things that you know could be she can learn or he can learn in in you know over the next 60 days or whatever. So I think that's a huge one that, so, that Paul mentioned. I want to just thank you. Um, I want to. There's an issue. There's a question here. Um, there's sometimes an issue of trust between the Latinx community and employers. Any thoughts on ways to break down that that lack of trust? I think just before you jump in on this question, I mean, I think thinking about like, well, where are Latinos in? Uh, you know, at are they all at, at all? Uh, levels of the workforce. Um, so I think that's kind of a, you know, a, how factors into that question. But um, Franklin, you want to take that question? Should I try and answer sure, that? No, I, I definitely agree with you, Claudia. Uh, I'm thinking about Juan Lopera, who's now the head of diversity, uh, 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 one of the huge uh, healthcare provider here in Massachusetts. Uh, that is sending a signal to the Latino workforce yeah. in Massachusetts that you have a future working for this organization. So um, I think about, I think it was mentioned early, but I'm, I'm working with a manufacturing company. They want to bring English classes to many of their immigrant employees and Spanish classes to their supervisors. So there is 
so, so they, that the Latino and the immigrants in general see the effort that the other, the, the, the other workers are also putting into communicating with them. Uh, quickly, I want to answer two of the questions in the chat. One is about uh, uh, community college trying to attract uh, talent. Uh, private schools, private uh, higher education organizations are getting a lot of, of the people. I know that because the community college are government are uh, part of the government is a little harder, but if they can do it, you can do it too. It's all about these transferable skills, all about uh, going the, the extra step of trying to dig a little uh, deeper into what is the credential these people are bringing. And the last thing about uh, somebody mentioned that some of those diploma and credential are not accepted in the US, if we got to take this one, uh, one case at a time, case by case, because it's not the same if, if you are a, a foreign, foreign trained medical doctor or if you are um, a teacher. I, I'm, I'm a teacher. When I came to this country, going back to social network um, and social capital, you know, I, I brought letters of recommendation translated into English. I chose the only supervisor that I had that uh, speak English and, and he was able to have a, a, a referral call back in the Dominican Republic with the people that were trying to hire me here. There are ways that we don't have to uh, waste years before we can come back to our careers. Thank you so much. I, I don't, uh, Laura, are we out of time? <laughs> we are out of time, uh, okay. ladies and gentlemen, but thank you so much everyone for joining us today. Um, you will receive a, a feedback survey. We'd love to get your insights, your thoughts. If you fill out the survey, we can also send you uh, the recording for the session as well as contact information. Um, and I do want to take a second to invite you all to our next session, which is going to be around elevating Latinx owned businesses. Um, it's going to be Spanish first um, with English translation available. And it's being uh, run by the Secretary of Labor and Workforce Development, Rosalind Acosta, and Franklin Caraballo from Caraballo Accounting, when we'll be discussing employee engagement and workforce development in Spanish first, promoviendo el éxito de las empresas latinas. So join us for that in two weeks. Um, and we're so excited. Thank you so much to all of our panelists um, and hope you all have a great rest of your week. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Let's stay in touch. Yes, yes. Thank you. Great meeting you guys, Paul, Franklin. It was wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you.